You are now mine. Oh. So one and two. One, two, we sat next to each other for a while. Are we, are we live? Yeah. We are live. Yeah, I There's an that. extra chair. <laughs> we are live. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate you forsaking Bank M&A for this. Um, you won't be sorry. <laughs> um, I think what we want to do is to start off just to kind of give a little bit of maybe lay the groundwork for the type of big data that we're talking about, the type of big data that's used by banks and fintechs. Um, maybe I'll start with you, John, and you can kind of give us a quick rundown, then Natalie, and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, so uh, hi, John Pitts from Platt, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with sort of the basics of what we're talking about, right? Which is we've entered an era where consumers have uh, both the expectation and the right to be able to take their financial data from someone who's holding it for them and share it with someone who they want to be able to use it to get a product or service. And I think the three key watchwords there um, <clears throat> are ubiquity, utility, and unfinished, right? I won't say UDAP because uh, no one wants to hear that word here. <laughs> Um, ubiquity. 88% of consumers are using some sort of fintech app right now. Whether it's from a bank or from a non-bank, uh, it is ubiquitous in consumers' life. Utility, they're using it because it delivers significant value for them. So examples of what they're doing, you know, student loan repayment is incredibly complex for someone to navigate. There are 37 different repayment plans, and asking a consumer to figure out which one they fit into is a, a lot of cognitive burden on the consumer. So there's apps that say, let us look at your student loan finances and, and your income and all those other things, and we'll tell you what plan is the cheapest plan for you. That type of utility is what consumers expect. Um, they expect it so much that 64% of them say they will leave their financial institution if they don't have access to that data portability and those data services. But then the last piece of this is unfinished, right? In a world where... Uh, that is the reality for most consumers, and data is regularly moving between a bank and a fintech and a tech company where we don't have national privacy law and we don't have a national open banking law, though that's hopefully coming soon. Um, there is a lot of work left to do to make sure that consumers have the right level of protection as they engage in that behavior but the behavior is going to sort of be there. That is the new normal for what consumers expect. And so what is left to finish? I think there's a couple of things, and hopefully a lot of this panel can, can touch on some of those next steps in regulation and, and what we want to talk about. But I think you know, some of the basic things like federal supervision of aggregators like Plaid, who are involved as a key part of this process, and then private partnership between uh, the participants, like aggregators and banks, working in FDX to develop some of the API standards for it, working together to develop the privacy tools to make sure that consumers have control over their data, even as it moves from one holder to another holder, is the unfinished part of this, and I think the part that's most important to get right over the next couple of years. Natalie, what about the bank perspective on that? We heard a little bit of the fintech side of this. Yeah, I think John just set up our whole discussion today. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Natalie Talbot with PNC Bank. Um, and I get to work with uh, all the fun people at the bank that are trying to figure out how do we support our customers when they want to use the applications and the use cases that, that John had described. And so certainly uh, you know, we're very interested in ensuring that our consumers and small business customers have a need and opportunity to do that. I think one of the things that, that keeps me up at night, though, is how much our customers understand all of the different aspects of sharing their data, even if they are permissioning it, mm -hmm. um, how much of their data is being shared with whom, um, in what ways, how is it being stored, um, do they understand that it's being stored outside of regulated financial institution in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in terms of you know, the environment that we find ourselves in, I think it's a matter of how do we balance, um, you know, ensuring our customers have access and opportunity to leverage tools like this, but also, um, you know, again, I take the role as a, of our customer's data steward very serious and understand how we can make it safe, secure, sound, um, uh, and, and, you know, 
maintain the trust that our customers place with us, as we've heard mentioned many times throughout today's con this week's conference. You said consumer trust. Um, maybe Chi Chi, kind of give us maybe your perspective at a high level, kind of what consumers know and what they don't know. So I'd like to start off by talking about the original big data. So that, you know, that we're discussing a little bit about bank account data, but the major form of big data in consumer financial services is obviously the credit bureaus. Um, and it's a form of big, big data that's pervasive. It's been around for a long time. The Fair Credit Reporting Act is 50 years old. It's data that consumers have absolutely no control over. They don't have any control over it being supplied to the big three credit bureaus, Equifax, Equity, and TransUnion. They don't have any much control over it being used. And they're not happy about it. So um, there's been a lot of cultural references today. I, I'm going to make a confession. I played hooky yesterday. And I went to the Colbert show instead of attending the sessions. I got a ticket. But that's actually not my favorite Colbert show memory. My favorite Colbert show memory is 2017, the Equifax data breach, which brought the uh, issues and problems with the credit bureaus to the front, forefront of the American public when Equifax <coughs> lost about data for about half of us. And Stephen Colbert talked about how with credit bureaus, consumers are not the customers, we are the commodity. He put it much more cleverly, you know, we're not the customers, we're the chicken. Uh, referring to a fried chicken joint. Um, and it's true. Um, you know, when I started uh, working in this area in the mid-2000s, there wasn't a lot of consumer understanding. A lot of people didn't know about credit bureaus, credit reports, credit scores. It's been increasing over the years. Still a lot of confusion. There's a survey from um, a few years ago finding that about half Amer of Americans thought their credit bureau information came from the federal government. Um, but as more and more consumers learn about the credit bureaus and about data, they don't like it. They're very unhappy. And that's why credit reports and credit reporting issues are the number one source of complaints to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Over 50%, hundreds of thousands every year. Consumers are sick and tired of not having control over their data, of not having control over it being harvested and being used, and they want control. And I think with bank account data and with 1033, which I know we're gonna talk about later, we have the opportunity to establish a paradigm where consumers do have control over their data and whether to share it and how to share it if we do it right. And if we do it right, we can have a system of data where consumers aren't always angry about it um, because that anger does have political and cultural consequences. Thank you. Gravetta, speaking of angry consumers, what can you tell us from the regulator's perspective? <laughs> well, you know, well, what a lead in. So hi, hi everybody. I'm Gravetta Gardner. I'm Senior Deputy Comptroller for Bank Supervision Policy at the OCC. So let me just say first and foremost, we have absolutely no supervisory responsibility for the credit bureaus. So <laughs> thank you, Chichi. Um, but we are bank supervisors, and one thing that we recognize is that with this innovation and you know technology, it becomes increasingly complex. It's faster. It makes consumers happy when it works. You get your information quickly. You can, you know, you can digest it. You can make decisions if it's clear, and if there's no consumer confusion. But that's where the anger comes in, because it's not always clear. From a bank regulator standpoint, we recognize that banks have a key role to play here, right, in keeping uh, data safe and sound making sure that there's fair access to financial services that are provided to consumers, and you know, being treated fairly. Being treated fairly and all of those things are part of the OCC's mission. But we have a disclosure system, and I'm not gonna say that as a but, it is what it is. We make sure that consumers are provided disclosures. They can read and understand who owns this data, who has control over it, who can they give it to, how can it be used? Is it a perfect system? Well, with the system that's been in place for as long as we've been doing things, I think it works until, again, the angry consumer that Chi Chi just referenced has to scroll through 
a lot of pages in very teeny font on that small computer that's in their pockets in order to get the app that allows them to have faster, better access to their data. Did they read all that? I'm just going to ask a quick question. When you guys want an app, how long do you spend reading the disclosures before you click OK to get the app downloaded <laughs> on your phone? Just raise your hand right now if that's you. So you want the app more than you want to understand who's collecting your data, what they're doing with your data, and where your data goes. Now, banks have relationships with third parties. They have had relationships with third parties for decades. And from a safety and soundness perspective, when we think about access, we also think about risk. Consumer confusion is a concern. If something happens to my data, am I dealing with the bank? Or am I dealing with some third party that the bank has a contractual arrangement with? If something goes wrong with my data, who am I going to as a consumer? Am I going to my bank? Or do I now know that I need to go to some third party? And what did they do? Is it my consumer protection? Or is it the security of my data? Interrelated, but not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So these are all big concerns mm -hmm. from a bank supervisor perspective. And things that I think we will continue to talk about with our colleagues yeah. as well as the other FDA. Thank you. Let's kind of segue now to the current legal landscape and some of the gaps, but I guess I'll take a minute and just level set for everybody. I mean, as we know in this country, we have what would probably be described as a patchwork of sectoral laws that apply to different people. Um, we don't have a uniform data privacy or even a data security law like they may have with GDPR or something of that nature. And it doesn't apply to everybody. Our laws typically are, again, sectoral and they apply to different entities. Different entities have different regulatory authorities and the like. It makes it much more difficult, I think, to come up with a uniform scheme or to understand how the entity that you're dealing with may be regulated um, in this country. So I guess that's what we want to explore today now that we've, we've already identified all the problems with the existing system. But you know, what are some of the gaps, John? What are, what are some of the things that are, that are causing problems out there? What are people doing about it? So Grovetta and Natalie actually just talked about one, and I completely agree with. Let me, <clears throat> because we're late in the afternoon, and because you all did not audience participate with Grovetta hard enough. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> I'm going to do audience participation, right? So <laughs> let's imagine there's a storefront, right? And this store sells a service. Bring in your bank statement, and we will look at your cable bill and look at your neighbor's cable bill. And if your cable bill is higher, we will call the cable company on your behalf and negotiate it down. And I bring all those statements in. And one night, someone breaks into the store and steals all the statements. Is my bank liable for that, I, that data breach? Put your hands up if you think the bank is liable for that data breach. OK, that's, oh, that's one, maybe. I, I, no, no, no payments. No just, payments. just the information. Just I'm handing. OK, so we're, yeah, we can get a reggae. But let's, we're just talking about data breach, like no reggae yet. We can get to reggae if you want to. <laughs> um, so now, let's say instead of the paper statement, I hold up my banking app. Mm -hmm. And they type it off the screen of my banking app. Any more hands for bank liability? I'm still just showing you off my banking app. What if the bank builds an API? and that storefront directly connects to the bank with the consumer's permission and the consumer's still telling them to do that. And now there's a data breach at the storefront. OK, you got some uh, hands. So now, now we got some now hands. Now you got right? some hands. But. So, but do we have certainty about that? I, don't, I would say I don't think we have certainty. And I would say that in a rational world, a clear concept of liability following the data and the consumer having a right of redress at each of those places where the data goes is what's necessary. And I think that as we move into an open banking world where this becomes normal, lack of certainty on where that liability sits is a, is a significant problem. It's a significant problem for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think like, not to argue the bank point here, but like, if I was a bank and I thought I might be liable for 6,000 downstream institutions who I don't have line of sight into, and they have a data breach, and that suddenly is my regulator talking to me, I would 
would not want that world to exist. And so I think that lack of certainty, this is not just what's the consumer data access right, but it is when something goes wrong, who's responsible and what is the edge of the regulatory perimeter and ultimately, there's also like a which regulator is covering which issue, right? right? Which is a, so I think that's one of the big gaps that's out there. I think when you combine that gap with the, what right does the consumer have to access what data under what circumstances, it looks like we're gonna get an answer from the CFPB on that fairly soon with a 1033 rule. Mm -hmm. I think that's one half of the problem, but I do think this, what happens if something goes wrong is the other half of the problem. And I guess, grow better to build on your point of are there limits to a disclosure-based regime? I think there's a third question, which is, should there be something in addition to a disclosure-based regime, right? Should there be something like, hey, even if you disclose to the consumer that you're going to sell their data for a hedge fund, to a hedge fund, you can't do it, right? Like there are, there are hard limits that we're gonna build into the system that need to be there because the consumer navigating this on this screen mm -hmm getting their once a year GLBA disclosure that's not adequate for the data environment that consumers are now in. So th those are my gaps. I'm sure there are other gaps. I mean, let's, carry, <laughs> let's just carry that data breach example down yeah. for a minute because I think, like you had said, we'll come back to the consumer protection, but ultimately what happens is you have consumer data that is stored outside of the bank, whether it's a bank statement in the storefront in yep. your example, it's, it's stored outside of a supervised entity, right? Mm -hmm. And you have varying degrees and differences in data security standards, applications, liability to your point in terms of who else gets, gets access to that. And so I think you were focused on the point you were trying to make around if there's a data breach, is the bank responsible? Well, in a lot of cases, data breaches occur and the bank doesn't understand and the customer doesn't understand until their identity is stolen their information is used fraudulently, mm -hmm. and then you have a fraudulent transaction on their account, who do they come to to understand and who's protecting them from that? Their bank. And so I think it's more than just um, the custody of data right at the, front, at the front of the process. You've gotta think things through all the way to the end and understand what information will be available with that fraudulent transaction. Can you tie it back to the company that you brought your cable statements into? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. But if you have the bank, right, and the bank actually engages or enters into a contractual arrangement with that party, right? So that's your third party risk management yep. at that point. I see what you're saying. So remember, I, that's a fact, 2017. <laughs> I don't wanna remember that. <laughs> remember what data was stolen. It was you know, data supplied by banks and lenders and creditors and there was a lot of discussion about the liability of the bank vis-a-vis mm -hmm. yes. yeah. vis -vis the third party right. service provider. Mm -hmm. And some of that led to um, the OCC drafting third party risk management guidance that actually talks in terms of the life cycle of that arrangement between a bank and a third party. So the importance of doing due diligence, the importance of the bank making sure that that third party that you have an, an arrangement with now understands, even though they may not be a regulated entity by one of the federal banking agencies, they're conducting business on behalf of a bank in the same way as if the bank were doing it. And so for many of you, I have to say, I'm a little surprised that no reaction to John's <laughs> question and so few hands going up in here that you could potentially have some liability from what's happening when you've got these statements that came from the bank that went someplace else. Everybody who had their hand down, I think you could have put them maybe halfway up <laughs> because there is some potential there. There is a responsibility, you know, as Natalie said, you gotta think about your consumers. These are your customers. Whoever you have an arrangement with, they don't know that. Not necessarily, it is not necessarily disclosed. When they got a problem, Natalie's right, mm -hmm. you're coming to your bank. And so this is where the customer to, in today's environment expects to be protected from data breaches. They expect to be protected from unauthorized usage of their data. You know, they need to understand it and I do, you know, I didn't say disclosures was obsolete or whatever <laughs> word you use. That wasn't what I said. But what I do think is we have to think about the evolution of where we are in this innovation in order to make sure that consumers understand where their data is, 
how their privacy is being protected. But more, well, not more importantly, but just as important, the security that's being applied mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. that data. Again, very interrelated. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. doing that at scale also becomes a huge problem, right? Because yes. I, was, I was cheekily silent in my API example on whether there was a contract between that storefront and the bank. Right. Because in a world where the consumer has a right to access their data, there might not be third party contracts between the bank <coughs> and the app, right? They're, they may just be That's true. accessing it, right? And so uh, we see in Europe, we've got a licensing regime that sort of covers that. I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether that's gonna happen in the US, but you do have this challenge of how do you conduct that diligence at scale with thousands and thousands of different parties. And I think there have been some really good innovations there. So like TrueSight, uh, which uh, TCH has uh, pioneered uh, and helped sort of bring in, is a way for banks to audit aggregators for their data security practices and a bunch of other things mm -hmm. at scale. Uh, Plaid is leading something with a number of uh, other parties, including uh, MX and very good security, uh, open finance data security standards, right, that sets a data security standard for the entire ecosystem that works from the smallest app to the largest uh, player that's sort of like an e-commerce player. But those types of scale tools are gonna be necessary and some of those are going to have to come from private sector collaboration between the players doing all of this stuff to make sure that it works correctly. I don't think, well, I'm not sure if it will all come top down from the regulator. I think some of it is gonna have to come bottom up because we do have a shared stewardship obligation for that consumer data that we're both handling in some of these transactions. I mean, I, I think that, well, first of all, with respect to disclosures, Gravetta, you stole my thunder. I've never had a regulator <laughs> do that before. I would I absolutely agree. Disclosure is not consumer protection, contrary to what one of the plenary speakers said. That stack of documents, you get it, for example, in a mortgage signing, that's not consumer protection. Consumer protection has to be about control, transparency, and most of all, fairness. And I know yes. in earlier panels, people did not like the idea of UDAP and fairness, but really, it's how the consumer that's wants right. to be treated yeah. fairly. Um, and you know, dashboards and the technology are great for some of that. I think that's great, but I think we need to go deeper. Um, data, for example, when a consumer does know, first of all, consent should never be the nice tight click consent that John, you talked about. Let's mm -hmm. just, just say that. That's not consent, okay? That's just like whatever, window dressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, even when you have the consent, the consent should be treated fairly. So. You know, if I'm giving you consent for one purpose, don't go taking that data and use it for another purpose. Mm -hmm. If I'm giving it to you for credit underwriting, do not use it for collections. Mm -hmm. I know John hates that, <laughs> that example. I, I, think, I, I think that's a when totally fair example. When you give it to your data, yeah. do not use it for other purposes. Yeah, yeah. And, and do right. not use it indefinitely. If I give it to you for a one-time credit approval, don't keep going back and tapping that data year, you know, years afterwards. Mm -hmm. Deal with the consumer the way you would want to be, your data to be dealt with. Um, and I think, I think, you know, having the having some of the technology come from industry is great, but I also think it should be built into the legal regime because, frankly, not all companies may be as good as Plaid. You know, uh, fintechs are not monolithic, and some are better than others. Um, and so there has to be some regulatory intervention in this. Um, and, you know, if it doesn't come from the federal regulators, you see it's coming from the states. California, California Consumer Privacy Act, that grew out of a groundswell of anger over uses of data. Um, the other thing about regulatory regimes, and you, John and I have this discussion a lot, is there are <laughs> applicable laws. There is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which doesn't apply to just That's the big right. three. If, if it's third party data is used for credit underwriting or employment or insurance, it's covered. And mm -hmm. it's covered under some rules that I think, you know, they may be 50 years old, but they make sense. That's right. Accuracy. Got to make sure that that stuff's accurate. You have to have procedures for accuracy. Dispute. If a consumer says that it, that's mm -hmm. not accurate, that's wrong, you should be able to dispute it and get it fixed. Disclosure of what a company has about you, okay? Just a file disclosures. And notices when the information's used against you. Those are all basic fair information practices that grew out of some thinking 50 years ago. And again, the word, fundamental word is fairness. How do you treat 
the consumer in a way that you would want to be your data to be treated. So, mm -hmm. Chi Chi, I think you're right when you talk about that. You you call it gaps. I'll call it the patchwork quilt mm -hmm. of the federal regulatory framework, because you do have you know laws that apply to everyone. FICRA applies to everything. GLIBA applies. You, these are the ones that happen. We do have CFPB working on 1033. You've got third-party risk management where our guidance has now been put out for you know, uh, notice and comment just to see if we have it right. It is all risk-focused. It is all about being fair to that consumer. So long-standing laws, they've been around for a long time, but they are applicable today, notwithstanding these innovations. So the patchwork is there. It's a foundation. It needs to evolve like everything else that we see. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. That leads us probably, now that we've, we've beat up the existing system a little bit, <laughs> kicked it around, maybe we can kind of build it back up here, maybe talking about some of the things that kind of on a go-forward basis would enhance our existing system. Chi Chi, you know, you've talked about it a little bit on the disclosure side, but, you know, what's, what's this fairness, you know, consent look like? What's it look like from your perspective? It doesn't sound like it's a privacy notice. It's about consumer control over their own data. I mean, I, I said it earlier, and I'll say it again. Um, it's about the ability to turn it on, turn it off, see where it's being used, not have it used in ways you're not expecting. Um, we've advocated in our comments to the CFPB on 1033 um, about sort of the rules of the road. And, and it's especially important for bank account information because there's, it's such a rich source of information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, transactions you're talking about, not only how much, but who you paid, you know, political donations, charitable contributions, where you shop, uh, you know, where your kid goes to camp. Um, it's a really rich source of data, and so it should be protected as such. Um, it's also a very powerful source of data and a source of data that can be the next stage, stage in the evolution of credit analytics in a good way. Um, you know, going back to the Stephen Colbert reference, one of the frustrations of American consumers about the credit bureau is there's no competition between the three of them. It's not just an oligopoly of three. It's an oligopoly of three you can't pick. They own... The, the, the data space, or they own the data space. Um, cash flow, I think, is potentially the future of credit underwriting. It's a much more powerful source of, but it's a sensitive source. And having the consumers be able to control it, having strong protections about it, has the potential of creating the better mousetrap, the, 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 the better next stage of the evolution you know, uh, I, I don't agree with the early plenary speaker that credit analytics haven't, haven't evolved since the Egyptians. I do think there's been some, <laughs> <laughs> some improvements. I think cash flow is a potential improvement, but only if it's handled right. Because if it's not handled right, you know what's going to happen? Consumer, you know, even more consumers are going to back out of the traditional banking system if they think their data is being abused. They're going to, you know, either stick with fintechs or just keep that stuff under their mattress. You know, we saw uh, consumers fleeing the banking system over overdrafts. A lot of anger and unhappiness and, and people who got hit with overdrafts opting out of the banking system. I think if their data is abused, that's another potential driver of consumers out of deposit accounts, which we all don't want to see, right? We, we all want folks in the deposit system. Mm -hmm. Uh, Natalie, maybe from the, the bank perspective, you know, what, what could improve the experience and what could kind of give the consumers faith in the banking system, for lack of a better expression? Yeah, I think I'm just sitting here because we've hit on so many different topics. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, like, how do, we, how do we even summarize what needs to happen still? Um, and I think, you know, I agree a lot with, Gigi, with what you said. You know, we've hit consent. We've hit, I think, in, in general, I think all of us up here agree in, in, the, in, in the room on the principles, right? enabling consumers um, to, to use their data to ensuring that they have the right consent, they understand how it's being used, they control it, um, they stop it, they limit it, et cetera. So, so I think when I think back to, um, you know, over the course of the pandemic and really just prior to the pandemic, many of us were in D.C. at the CFPB mm -hmm. talking about things and, and starting to get this moving with the rulemaking. And 
you know, I, I feel like we were saying a lot of the same things, right? And so when I think about what has changed since then and now is, sure, there's been some improvements um, uh, with some of the larger banks and some of the larger data aggregators striking agreements, um, data access agreements that do um, provide some guidance as to how data should be accessed through over an API with um, permissioning that takes place at the bank um, versus um, you know, a screen scraping environment where a customer is forced to share their user ID and password that's stored um, and used to access their information, um, which is you know, that's where the term screen scraping comes from. They log in, they collect the information and store it. Um, I think that hasn't moved fast enough. I think that there's, like I said, there's been, there's been progress in kind of these one-to-one -one agreements. You've got kind of this web um, that I can only imagine creates some differences for, are we hitting all the marks on the consumer protections? Are, are, are all of those giving consumers the right level of, um, of support that they, that they need and require? And so I think, um, uh, you know, PNC made an investment um, a couple of years ago along with 11 other banks in a utility called Akoya that um, ideally would give not just large banks the opportunity to engage in executing data access agreements, but small, medium-sized banks coming together as a utility, right? Um, data is not stored at Akoya. It's passed through, and it enables many-to-many many -many connections, um, creating a consistent environment um, for banks to provide access to their customers to safely and securely permission their data. So um, I think you know, another enabler, John hit on the, um, uh, you referred to it differently and I want to clear it up. Yeah, it's not just true site, others can, can use it. It's um, uh, the cyber assessment that was oh, created yeah, yeah. specific mm -hmm. for this type of environment. Because this isn't, this isn't a traditional third party That's agreement. Um, this is unique, right? It's different. Um, and there are different terms, it's structured differently. There's, there's different things that, that need to be important. And, um, and so anyway, that was one enabler that was, that was put in a couple years ago, is this, this cyber assessment. I think John mentioned briefly at the start too, the industry group FDX or financial data exchange, um, John and I sit on the board together. Um, so it's, it's an industry group made up of banks, data aggregators, and fintechs to talk about and maintain the industry standard. We talked a lot about standards in this conference and, and um, the ability to, to, to make change quickly. And I think that was one of the really smart things we did um, early on was create a standard for what the API needed to, um, to look like and how it was structured. So I think we've done, as an industry, a lot of things to enable it. Very much looking forward to um, understanding where our regulators see and how they can continue to support it. Um, but I, I, I think those are some gaps. I think one other thing that I, I don't want to lose sight of, too, is, um, you know, John, you mentioned the liability should follow the data. I think one of the things that, that I'm very interested in is ensuring that an intermediary like a data aggregator is going to have responsibilities in the same way that I have respons responsibilities for ensuring that if a customer is going to permission their data outside, I'm paying attention to the, the, the environment. So I think data aggregators and others should have responsibilities of data security principles, use, mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, anything, you know, can go back, it's common sense, right? Um, uh, anything that a bank would be looking for, we need to continue to see that liability move down. Um, and follow follow the data. Uh, and I could not agree more with that. I mean, I think like supervision of data aggregators is probably one of the most important things that is going to come out of the 1033 rule, right? Mm -hmm. Because while banks and aggregators have been able to develop, I think some real progress on trust with each other over the last couple of years, um, right? Trust but verify is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between being a supervised agent <laughs> entity and not being a supervised entity. And I don't think we're ever going to get to the level of partnership that is necessary for our shared customer without some sense that we are being held to the same standards by the CFPB under a supervised regi regime mm -hmm. that you all are being held to. And I think mm -hmm. that's totally appropriate and is one of the critical next steps. I would say the other critical next step that hasn't been mentioned so far is uh, focusing on consistency. So whatever that consumer consent experience looks like. I think one of the big risks in this more open system, we've got 6,500 customers and we connect to 14,000 financial institutions. So let's imagine a world where you multiply those two numbers against each other to get all of the different consent flows that a consumer might go through to permission the same data. Mm -hmm. Like that's 
not That's great, let's say. I'll, I'll just say the potential for that is not great. And I've seen some consent flows where it's like, you know, the FI wants to, uh, everyone in this room is lawyers, so you all have drafted these things and you want to make sure they're <laughs> thorough. Like, the FI wants to disclose every possible thing that every app could possibly do. So someone wants to sign up for Venmo and the disclosure says, you are sharing your tax information with Venmo. It's like, what? <laughs> No, I'm not, right? And they are not, in fact, sharing their tax information with Venmo. Right. But because you want to cover everything that could possibly happen, you are telling the consumer in 3,000 pages of mouse type that they're your <laughs> birthday, mother's maiden name, tax information, right. name of your dog. Um, I think in a rule, some real explicit guidance on what that consent flow should look like so that it is standard and so that every FI and every app and every aggregator doesn't feel like they need to invent from scratch their own version of what consent looks like. Now, I understand there's going to be some discrepancy because every bank and hopefully every aggregator is going to have that prudential obligation of really doing their own risk assessment and saying, this is what we think our customer needs to know. But even within FDX, we've been able to align on a set of user experience principles of like, this is basically what it should look like. Everyone should right. be fairly close to this. I think having the additional regulatory guidance of um, this is what good consent looks like in an open process. These are what good data controls look like. This is how, you know, if you are instructing an app to turn off data access, the aggregator needs to know, the bank needs to go, needs to know. You don't need to make the consumer go to every single one of those places and give the same instruction, stop using my data or delete my data. You should have that flow through built into the system I think those are the, the next things that I'm excited to see. I'm also very excited to join all of you in the circle of supervised entities uh, by the federal government. It is so refreshing to hear somebody <laughs> say they <laughs> want to be supervised by the federal government. And you know, you really do get a gold star for that one, Sean. <laughs> but I think it is, you know, it, it just shows foresight and that level of consistency that you're talking about. I do think everybody has to have some skin in the game because yeah. fintech, big data, financial institutions, regulators, everybody's got to have some skin in the game in order to make this work well and for consumers to feel and know that they are being treated fairly because fairness really is the bottom line here. So, you know, when you talk about the, the framework, I want to go back to something that Chi Chi talked about, which is really, you know, the, the benefits of that cash flow data, right? And what it can do. So there is this, you know, like probably very little known piece of guidance that was issued by all of the banking regulators mm -hmm. in December of 2019 that, you know, in normal times, we would have done that in December and then we would have been speaking about it at conferences starting in like February. So what happened? Well, we had this little thing came up called COVID, and we never got a chance to talk about it. But this was that interagency guidance issued by the OCC, the Fed, the FDIC, and the CFPB that talked about the use of alternative data and being very clear that all the rules apply. Okay? So fair credit reporting, you that. Fair lending, you name it. If you're going to use this traditional data before a new purpose, right? because cash flow data was not being utilized to determine credit ability to repay. In fact, when I would talk to financial institutions about it, probably starting somewhere around 2016 and suggesting, you know, you have all of this data that I believe would be incredibly useful to you to really understand what's happening with your consumers and their ability to repay. And I was resoundingly pushed back and told, no, 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 we really don't have it. Now, unbeknownst to most of bankers, you know, I also have policy for BSA AML, so I was able to say, no, I know you have it because you actually look at every single transaction going through your bank. And then the thing was, yeah, but we don't use it for credit, not like that. Well, maybe you should think about having these systems talk to each other because perhaps, and this is not a wrap against the credit bureaus, I leave that to Chi Chi. But <laughs> that's my job. That's my job. <laughs> don't steal it. But the one thing I will say <laughs> is that the wealth of information that is in that transactional data 
that actually gives you a real-time picture of what the consumer is going through, what they can do, how they use their finances, how they actually are able to make the rent payments or the mortgage and put the food on the table and pay all the bills and keep the lights on, all of those things that are great indicators of ability to repay. And now, you know, what we found out was, well, we're not quite sure what we can do, so hence this 2019 piece of guidance. That to me was and should be recognized as, a, as you know, an indication that the FDA has continued to talk, look, and try to adapt. We didn't necessarily need a rule, we just needed a piece of guidance that said, no, all the rules do apply. All the laws apply when you use this, but you can use it. We're not saying that you can't in order to achieve good underwriting. Things that are good for the consumer. And that's something consumers understand, right? This is data that they can see every day in these apps that they have. This is how they manage. And so I think it's incredibly important to look at that patchwork quilt that I talked about. It's not gaps, it's just a <laughs> framework. It's a framework that all of the FDAs, we all have slightly different missions but when you put it all together and we are focused on the innovations and we are looking at these contractual arrangements. Natalie, you're right, it's not necessarily your typical third party agreement, mm -hmm. but the risk management around third party agreements okay. still applies. Mm -hmm. It's still the basis mm -hmm. and that's where we are building on the basis of what we have as a foundation. I don't think we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think we will continue to look and engage with fintechs, big data, financial institutions, and our consumer advocates. Because when we put everybody together, we can actually solve for these things a lot faster. And we can give the consumers the kind of control that they need while managing the risk that you know, could put these things at risk. We need to know that the security pieces are there. We go in, we examine for that. We need to know that the data rules are being, the privacy protection rules are being applied. We go in, we examine for that. And that is our role. That's what we're gonna come in. We're gonna see where the patchwork quilt does not necessarily connect in today's environment and look to see where a good rule either collectively or independently, depending on who needs to be covered, is going to make the biggest difference. And we are focused on all these things. I would say, that, so the one thing, you know, just to kind of put a finer point on it maybe is, is the road forward legislation, regulation, contracts, model forms, what, what is actually, yes. I just, yeah, yes. it's, it's, it's yes, it's yeah, all, yes, it's, all it's of all the above. <laughs> I don't know that you can get away with, you know, the, the technology, the innovations, everything that we have today, and, and we've seen some new cases now that have come down through the courts that make it pretty clear, perhaps we need to think about legislation that anticipates and looks at where we live today. We have a lot of foundational rules and regs and, and statutes, but they certainly did not ever anticipate some of them that we would be living, you know, I'm gonna date myself, in the world of the Jetsons, you know? <laughs> almost everything that you ever saw in that cartoon when you were growing up is actually a part of our lives today, save the flying cars. But, you know, since our legislative framework didn't necessarily anticipate all of these things, I think we may have to have some legislative changes that level set and connect the tissue between our foundational regulations and where we need to go next. The other thing I would put a pin on or emphasize, and there was some discussion, is, is standardization. Um, mm -hmm. Not only of the controls, but of the use of the data. Uh, I mean, that's where the credit bureaus, for better or worse, have the advantage. They have a common data dictionary, the Metro 2 reporting format, um, and they have one analytics model. Um, the analytics are going to be important. They're going to be important both to harness the better predictive power, but also to make sure that disparities affecting protected classes don't get exacerbated, but are actually hopefully reduced. Mm -hmm. We have a minute left. We have no questions from the audience. So I guess I would just maybe ask for just some concluding remarks, just brief remarks from each of you. 
John, you can start. You start. Oh, John, man. you always start. I'm the regulator. I get to go last. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess to tr Natalie's right, like wrapping this all up into a bundle Natalie's is right. basically impossible. <laughs> Natalie's right, That's everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the part I heard. <laughs> uh, so I want to go back to the yes to answer your question. Yeah. Like this is an all hands on deck moment. We have 1033 coming. It is going to shift a fundamental rule on data portability in financial services. That is not the end of the process. Like we need to get that right, but it is also going to take a lot of other things, including maybe thinking about third party risk, maybe thinking about other things, like thinking about it in that environment, mm -hmm. thinking about what the consumer needs, thinking about what businesses need to do in collaboration with each other to make it all work. Mm -hmm. Like this is the starting gun. Yeah. And everyone in this room should hear that starting gun firing and get moving on it because otherwise we are going to do one piece of this and not the rest of it and that will increase risk in the system. And Natalie's right. And I think that's what, <laughs> and I think that's where, that's where we are today, right? Like yeah. I think we've made progress in, 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 in small pieces but in order for it to all come together, I, I do think it's, it's everything that Jeff mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just say that, you know, we've talked a lot about the promise in the future. I would just say that, you know, uh, we, the consumer always should have the right not to be in the system. That's what the competition. If the consumer has a, a fat credit file and a good credit score, they, they should be able to completely opt out of this. Um, but, you know, this, I mean, I know there was a panel on financial inclusion, but, you know, this, this, this is the potential. It's got to be done right. And I think, um, you know, I think, right, it, it, we need sort of all of the above. Legislation, I would be careful, though, because um, legislation, there are a few <laughs> principles that consumer advocates live and die by. Pre no preemption, private remedies, um, and, uh, yeah, no preemption. It, it seems I like there are- Why would you say that and then look at me? So I say yes to all of those. I'm, I'm not necessarily afraid of legislation because I think that legislation done correctly can help propel us. And it gives the foundation for regulatory guidance, other things that will be necessary to like really make this full circle. You know, we can talk about the starting gun and you can talk about the future, but actually I think the future is really right now. We have to be on top of this today. And I do want to harken back to something that Acting Comptroller Sue said early this morning, because while fairness is the key here for consumers, it also is fundamental to trust in the banking system. And that really gets back to who are you dealing with? Are you dealing with a bank? Are you dealing with an aggregator? Are you it was Michael's the comments bank? yesterday, yeah. That mm -hmm. really is The it. line between the bank and the consumer. So, yeah. you know, this is an opportunity for us to reestablish a level of trust that, you know, for various reasons has been eroded and needs to be rebuilt. This is the system that we have. This is the safety net that we have. This is where fairness should originate and this is where consumers should feel safe. With that, I want to thank the panelists. Thank the audience for coming. Thank you. Cheers.